Fall has arrived, the leaves are turning color, and the days are getting shorter, and we are back on track after a short summer, a short break at the end of the summer. Uh, welcome to the Well Stewards Huddle for today, Thursday, September the 24th. I am Bob Simpson, your host for this series of webinars. We started the series of webinars back in March entitled Your Guide Through the Storm, and we've recently transitioned to a new format called The Huddle. In our new format, the plan is to alternate between investment management and wealth planning on a biweekly basis. So this is the very first wealth planning session in this series of webinars. Now, whether you are in the wealth accumulation phase, the wealth distribution phase, that is you're starting to draw money from your savings to support your retirement lifestyle or some other phase, investment is the only part of the equation or is not the only part of the equation. And in fact, investment is the part of your plan with the most uncertainty. Where there is great deal of certainty is in your wealth plan where you address such things as how much money you're going to need for retirement or a major purchase and how to structure your savings so you take advantage of legal tax strategies so as to optimize your savings and tax after tax cash flow. Or maybe you need our help to structure your will and estate to achieve what we call intergenerational peace of mind. The proper combination of a wealth plan built on a strong foundation and long-term investment plan is going to help you to get on and stay on track to your goals. Now, joining me today is Andrew Bryden. Andrew is a wealth counselor with Wealth Stewards. He provides comprehensive wealth management advisory to affluent families and business owners. His objective is, or he is objective and his goals-based approach to encompasses personal corporate tax planning, risk management, employee benefits, investment services, retirement planning, estate planning, and succession planning. Also on the call today is Paul Tires, a regular contributor to the huddle. Uh, Paul is managing director and portfolio manager for Well Stewards. Now, a couple of housekeeping things before we get into the uh, uh, into today's huddle is that all of these sessions are recorded. And if you go to uh, portfoliostewards.ca, um, you can see all of the webinars that we've done all the way back to March, a uh, broad range of topics. Might be worthwhile if you have some chance, have a bit of time. And secondly, at the on your control panel um, for, the, uh, for the Zoom call today, you'll see a Q&A button. Now, just I want to try something just to encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you are watching this right now, click on the Q&A button and just type in, hi, Bob, and then hit enter. And uh, just send me a message that, uh, uh, that you're on here, um, just to get some experience doing that. Now, to kick the ball off, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. And Paul, during our sessions, our guide to the storm, we discussed in one of them especially um, that as a result of the government initiatives uh, to keep the economy the economy afloat during the pandemic, that tax planning is going to be even more important coming out of the plan pandemic than ever before. Um, can you just uh, let me start you there? I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, you know, as we've been into this pandemic, I've had the opportunity uh, from time to time to travel. Last week I was in BC and in a meeting with somebody from uh, the East Coast, a couple of people from the West Coast, and I guess we're more or less in the middle. And I can assure you, the people on this call, that virtually everybody believes that there are going to be changes to various aspects of our taxation system to actually pay for the cost of the pandemic. So no doubt about it, uh, it's an important area. So uh, I think we should delve into a couple of uh, details uh, on this. Uh, just the agenda for today, uh, just a little bit of an introduction of, you know, sort of what some of the, wealth, the tax considerations are. 
uh, then Andrew's going to take us through sort of a clear, deep understanding of the marginal tax rate income tax system. Uh, and, and then we're going to look at different how different types of income are taxed. A little bit on the RSV versus our TFSA and which is best for the individual. But one of the things I want to emphasize is that everybody's tax plan is as individual as them themselves and their family circumstances. And then we're going to end it up with a Q&A session where hopefully we'll have lots of participation. So one of the things when we th often think of taxes, we think of income taxes. However, as we all, as most of the people on this call will know, there's a lot more to the story than income taxes. And um, uh, after watching the speech from the throne last night and listening to the follow-up uh, different leaders, uh, I'm convinced that new forms of taxation or changes in taxation are not going to be limited to just to, uh, to income taxes. And so one of the things that when we think of taxes, we want to be holistic when we're having a view because each of these areas has implications on people's financial plan and their overall growth. Uh, I, for one, believe that it's the estate area that is probably going to see some of the greatest concentration of incremental taxation um, simply because at that point in time, as we know, uh, people are less concerned. Well, the family usually wants to move beyond that. Uh, and I think that will be an area where there's going to be a lot more capital they're looking for. Now, I also put the, uh, and the reason for using the different shapes is, you know, taxation comes in all different shapes and sizes. And the star is not because I'm happy about this, but the reality is there are new, that I believe there will even be new forms of taxation. One of our advisors in this office is from Switzerland, where he was responsible for the largest family office in Switzerland. And they have a wealth tax that is in addition to any of the others that you see here. And it has everything to do with if you own over a certain hurdle rate, you pay X percent of your net worth on an annual basis. So get ready, Canadians. I think it's, uh, it's only just begun. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that I think is important to understand is that um, the, the very business model that we run here at Wealth Stewards is collaboration with outside key advisors, and in particular, our client CPA. Um, and you can see in this figure here that so many elements are, of our wealth management are actually touched, have, have a connection rather to the taxes that are paid, clearly asset management. The, we're going to find out from Andrew the different, different levels of taxation related to certain asset classes. Uh, retirement planning, we know that we're able to come up with the assets are going to last longer, the less tax we pay. Uh, estate planning, there's some whopping bills to be paid, uh, whether we call them fees or we call them taxes, at the end of the day, it accomplishes the same thing for government and has a similar cost. So what's really key here is the business model in which we operate of collaborating with your CPA because they will have information that we couldn't have, and that's on some of the historical cost base and so on. When it comes to a business client, Often the business tax return has been done by the CPA. And so we want to collaborate in a manner that is really for the benefit of our clients. Now I can assure you, this is not the norm in the financial planning world. It is about our unique model of working with CPAs that allows us to really give an enhanced level of, uh, of tax planning that touches on each of these, uh, each of these areas. Next slide, and now I'm going to turn this over to Andrew to delve into some of the details that he want, he's going to go through with us. Okay, thank you, Paul. So some of the fundamental aspects in terms of tax planning really come down to, first off, understanding the marginal tax system and how that works. So this is a detailed 
table, if you will. However, it's important to understand that certain levels of tax or taxable income are taxed differently. So for example, if we start off the top here of the table, the first amount of taxable income every year is taxed at 20%. And going down other income, for example, as your taxable income increases, the, the amount of which the additional dollar of income is taxed at a different rate. So that is the first step to, to understand. Now, the next step is to also understand looking from left to right, other income, capital gains, and Canadian dividends that different types of income are also taxed differently. For example, other income includes salary and interest. Capital gains are, they arise when you sell property or sell stocks or shares and have a capital gain. And then dividends, there are two different types of dividends. Two, to being large corporations pay the eligible dividends and private corporations pay non-eligible. The difference between those two is that the eligible dividends have a lower tax rate compared to non-eligible because the larger corporations have, have already paid a higher amount of taxes. So for example, if we look at the section here in the, the red box, as one example, you can see that interest or salary income is taxed at 43%. Compared to mo moving to the right, capital gains are taxed at only 21% in that tax bracket. And then dividends are taxed at 25 and 36% respectively, de de depending on if, if the dividends are paid from a large corporation or a private corporation. So the overall point here is that understanding the type of income that you're receiving and knowing how it is taxed and at what rate, there are strategies to minimize taxes over the long term. Next right. slide, Andrew, can, Andrew, can I just butt in with a quick question is, so what's yeah. the difference between average tax rate and marginal tax rate? Okay, good question. So the average tax rate is if you take your overall, how much you owe in taxes divided by your income, that's the average. Mm -hmm. However, that's really less important compared to the, the marginal tax rate. For, for example, if someone is earning, say $120,000 per year, and we're having a conversation about how much makes sense to put into to RSPs, well, then we should be looking at their marginal tax bracket. So let's utilize, for example, to bring their taxable income down to $97,000. So maybe in this hypothetical situation, putting enough into the RSPs to bring their income down to fully utilize that tax bracket, that's utilizing their top marginal tax bracket compared to really looking at the average, the average tax rate is less important, long story short. Right, so the average tax rate for somebody in a 43% tax bracket, maybe mid twenties, is that, that's kind of as a ballpark, but the marginal tax rate is the rate at which people pay tax on every extra dollar earned that, yeah, I guess a... to, to, to be fair, I care more about the marginal tax rate. The mm -hmm. average tax rate, uh, frankly, is not really very important. Right. Other than people thinking, whoa, am I paying 43% on every dollar that I make? And that's not the case, right? Correct. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Next slide. Yeah. Yep. So another question that we have quite often is, concerning the decision about RSPs versus tax-free savings accounts or TFSAs. And I bring this up because I 
have seen many times that, for example, people maybe sometimes are a bit short-minded and not considering long-term tax planning in this regard. So not to be too simplistic, but to, to break it down, for example, on the left side here, we have pre-retirement income. So if you may be in the situation that in the future, your income currently is higher than, than it will be in the future, then RSPs make sense because you can take advantage of putting, making the RSP contribution currently when you're in a higher marginal tax bracket and then therefore take it out in the future at a, a lower tax bracket. So you may, for example, be in the 43% tax bracket currently and then take it out sometime in the future and only pay 20% taxes, for example. Now that being said, there may be the, the, the situation where looking at your taxable income currently and your taxable income in the future, your income may be the same. So in that regard, RSP still could make sense because you can defer the taxes. So get the tax benefit and deduction now and take it out down the road in the future at a, a at the same tax bracket. However, you have the benefit of that deferral. So in that regard, or that situation, if you will, then a mixture of contributions to RSPs and a TFSA makes sense for you. Now this next one. A little too quick on you. Sorry, Michael, come back. So, this one is something that I certainly want to, to mention because I've seen it the past 15 years myself and with my friends in particular, when people are maybe starting off their career and their income potential would be higher in the future, say someone, for example, in their mid twenties are recently graduated, for, they may be making you know, 40, $50,000 per year, for example, and their income potential is higher in the future. So I would question, why would you want to invest in RSPs right now when you're, you, you, you can build up the RSP contribution room and utilize that in the future at a higher marginal tax bracket and have a higher tax benefit? So in that regard, a tax-free savings account makes more sense financially. So the next topic is about asset location. Now the pie chart here shows a typical balanced portfolio. On the right side, we have fixed income or bonds. On the left side, we have the green section, which are the equity portion. Now coming back to what we talked about briefly, that interest bearing assets or fixed income, such as bonds, have a higher marginal tax or higher taxable rate compared to capital gains and dividends. And capital gains and dividends are generated by equities. Again, the left side, the green portion. So when it comes to asset location, prudent tax planning in also involves having your fixed income or interest bearing assets in registered accounts or your RSP and TFSA because RSP and TFSA being registered accounts do not have taxable implications. So you can have the same portfolio, like for example, the same pie chart, but from a tax perspective to minimize personal taxes, have your fixed income held in registered accounts and your equity securities held in non-registered accounts, thereby the dividends and capital gains in non-registered overall, you have a lower personal tax situation.
So Andrew, in the wealth stewards model, um, where we work with accounting firms, um, how do you how do you work with the accounting firm to develop this upfront strategy? Maybe it's not upfront. Maybe it's part way as the relationship is is developed, but. Um, you know, it is important to make sure that you optimize the tax structure of the accounts. How do you work with the accounting firms to uh, make sure that that our clients get the best result possible? Good question, Bob. So well, when we have these meetings and discussions, we always do our analysis first. And before circling back with our client, we have a meeting with the accountants to make sure that we're all on the same page and that they concur. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is as opposed to working with, let's say an accountant referred a, uh, referred a client to just another advisor. Uh, what the, what's the difference in the flow of information between the advisor and the accountant to make sure that Number one, you get on track to begin, but you stay on track. Well, the absolute key is communication. Mm -hmm. Bob, right. if I could add uh, just a comment there. Um, I've often asked accountants who have clients who work with different uh, advisors, um, how often they get asked for a copy of the client's income tax return or their company's financial statement income tax return. And uh, the consistent answer is uh, either rarely or most often never. And candidly, I don't know how we could do the optimal job without the information or communication as Andrew has mentioned, but that's just the base information. Then when you develop a strategy, we also want to check back and make sure that we have concurrence. There's nothing we might be overlooking that the accountant, uh, uh, the accountant's perspective uh, might might add to the piece. So I think it it makes for a much stronger team when we, when there is the collaboration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just final final points, Andrew, Paul, before we do Q and A. Do you have any? Uh... Other points that you would like to share before I uh, open up the Q&A box? Yeah, I would just like to say that um, there is everything, there are so many tools that we have in our tool uh, toolbox uh, to deal with clients' individual circumstances. So what just popped into my mind there was when we're dealing with a doctor, for example, who likely has a medical corp these days, uh, due to some rule, uh, tax rule changes a few years ago, that makes a lot of their income in their corporation highly taxed. We have some tools or some investment vehicles that we use there that completely avoid the tax during the growth years and actually are are creating what we call the capital dividend account to even allow tax-free dividends to be taken out of a corp. So that's an example of tools that are in the tool belt. Uh, for somebody with different sets of circumstances, there are many tools that can be brought to bear uh, to really enhance somebody's overall plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got this open uh, question. I received dividends from Bank of America and is treated as non-eligible dividend. Is that the case for all stocks bought on foreign exchanges? Uh, the simple answer is that is a foreign company. So it's not eligible for the dividend tax credit in Canada. That's, that's why. Mm -hmm. Yep, so Paul, from an investment point of view, um, should people be building portfolios that are completely Canadian centric for the dividend for the improved tax treatment or are there 
lots of good reasons to invest in internationally, and especially in the U.S. Well, I, I think I think uh, that's a bit of a loaded question, Bob, because the reality is, if I look at the Canadian uh, market and the investment options, at least in the public markets, it's a very few options to choose from to be able to get um, even regular dividend income. Uh, so one aspect is certainly taxation, but it's not the only aspect. Uh, the US, for example, has the deepest capital markets by a long shot. And so uh, clearly when we look at companies like Microsoft uh, in the tech and others in the large tech space, we think it's important uh, to be looking at companies that are that are outside the Canadian market from a tax perspective, but going into it recognizing that it's not as advantageous from a tax perspective. Right. So if we look back ten years ago and we looked at um, we looked at let's say U.S. markets and we pulled out the ten biggest companies in the U.S. It was many names like Exxon and energy names. So Canada was a great place to invest when energy was the place to be. Now we're, you know, we're really the two areas of focus uh, for the best results over the last 10 years has been uh, technology and healthcare, healthcare being driven by demographics. Um, so yeah, so th there has been a reason to shift money and unfortunately, you don't get the uh, preferential tax treatment of Canadian companies, but uh, the investment options are greater. Okay, any other, uh, any other questions this afternoon? I mean, if I may, do you mind if I just elaborate on something somewhat related to that last comment? Yeah, absolutely. At the same time, I just want people to be aware that when it comes to holding foreign related securities in a tax-free savings account, notably in the, the US, I highly recommend not having any securities that pay dividends that are foreign related in a, a TFSA because the US does not recognize the fact that a tax-free savings account is a registered account. So for example, any company that does pay dividends, Bank of America, for example, then the US, even though it is a tax-free savings account, the United States do take a 15% withholding tax from their end. And at the same time, when you file your Canadian tax return, that 15% withholding tax that you paid is not eligible as a foreign tax credit. So you basically pay 15% and never get it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great point. Uh, so Paul and Andrew, uh, over the next, uh, you know, the balance of this year, once a month, we're going to be touching on subjects related to, to wealth planning, um, you know, sprinkled in between our investment meetings. Uh, can you give us a bit of a heads up on some of the things that we may be addressing over the next few months? And, and um, you know, perhaps is there is it possible that we're going to be able to put up a schedule of what the topics will be so that people can uh, mark it in their calendar a bit earlier? That's a loaded question I, too, because I know the answer. I, <laughs> Bob, if, we, if you don't have that list yet, I'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. But uh, what I will say is that, yes, there's no shortage of things to talk about. Um, with tax to me being right near the top of that, that list. But let's face it, tax has implications for uh, your, your income that you might need. Um, and so everything from estate planning to risk management um, to cash flow planning, uh, these are all topics that, that are interrelated. Uh, one touches on another and to me, the importance of a well-integrated financial plan has never been greater than it is on a go-forward basis. Um, with half a trillion dollars in new government debt, uh, 
I, for one, do not believe the solution that was given last night, and that is low interest rates as the solution. So uh, if we remember that back in 1917, income tax was returned, was income taxes were introduced as a temporary measure. As far as I know, that hasn't stopped. Uh, I think we are into a whole new sphere of, uh, of other ways that governments need money. And it's the people who have the money that will be the target for where those where that money comes from in the future. Okay, so awesome. So our next huddle session is going to take place on Thursday, October the 8th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the topic there is going to be investment management and, it's go and we're gonna focus in on both market and portfolio performance during the third quarter, which ends in a couple of days. Um, so we hope that you can join us for that one. And uh, if you can't make it, remember that we uh, post recordings of these so uh, you can access it through the Portfolio Stewards website. So thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us and Paul. And uh, thanks for everybody else who took some of their valuable time to spend with us this afternoon. And we hope to talk to you in a couple of weeks. Have a great weekend.